Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living TV. My guest today is Dale Borgum. He has a project called livingdying.org and it's about living in a conscious way and dying in a conscious way. We're going to be speaking about this and so much more about his incredible life from the 60s to the present time with Ram Dass, with Stephen Levine and many others of like-mindedness who were seekers of living consciously. And what is that all about, of living consciously, opposed to just going through life, sailing through life, and really not wanting to think about things, really not really wanting to feel things. So today I have the great honor and pleasure to speak with Dale. He's here in the studio, and I thank you very much. Welcome, Dale. Thank you for having me. So how are you today? I'm good. Great. So let's start from the very, very beginning of what it is. The, give me a brief history of Living and Dying Project, what it's all about. Well, uh, the name of the project is the Living Dying Project, and the website is livingdying.org. I used to be a mathematician. I have a PhD in mathematics, and while I was a graduate student at Stanford, I met Ramdas, who would stay at a home of a mutual friend whenever he'd come to Northern California. So back in the 70s, I became Ramdas's drinking buddy when he was in Northern California and began to realize through my association with him, but also doing yoga and meditation back there when these things were beginning in the West, that being a scientist was uh, not really engaging my heart in a way that I felt that I really wanted to engage it. So when I got done with Stanford, I went off to India. I met this guru named Crowley Baba who Ramdas was with. I came back to America and decided I didn't want to be a scientist anymore. And Ramdas then invited me to be the executive director of his umbrella corporation called the Hanuman Foundation that had service projects as part of what, what it was doing. And uh, one of the first things that happened was Ramdas went off to teach a workshop. And at that workshop, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came as a participant. And at that workshop, Stephen Levine was the meditation teacher. So Stephen and Elizabeth connected, they hit it off, and Elizabeth invited him to teach meditation at her retreats. Now, as most of you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was the first person in America to really bring dying out of the closet. There was a great deal of denial of death in the 50s and 60s and even in the 70s. But Elizabeth, being a physician back in Chicago, really saw that that needed to change. And she started talking about dying and was a pioneer, a true pioneer, affected many, many people. So she and Stephen taught together for a while and eventually decided to go their separate ways very amicably. And Stephen then came back to where we were there in Santa Cruz. I was living with Ram Dass and uh, we invited him to be the director of what Stephen called the Dying Project and doing what he was doing as part of our foundation. And very quickly, uh, Ram Dass and I saw that what Stephen was doing was by far the most interesting part of our, our foundation, and we began teaching with him. This was back in the late 70s, and eventually we thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to actually have a place, a physical facility, where people could come and uh, live and, if they, and work with their life-threatening illness in a conscious way. So in those days, really, the relationship with death was probably the one place in American society where consciousness had least penetrated. There was a great deal of denial of death, uh, even not even conscious dying, which is talking about dying at all. But we thought having this place where people could come from around the country who wanted to use their encounter with death as a way of awakening, that that would be a way to begin to change our society's relationship with death, both individually and collectively. So back in 1980, Stephen, Ramdas, and myself, we all moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. At right about this time, Stephen met his eventual wife, Andrea, 
And uh, for various reasons, Ram Dass, Ram Dass got busy and was on the road a lot, and Stephen was really getting involved with Andrea. So it was up to me to start the Dying Center. And from 1981 to 1984, we had a facility in the outskirts of Santa Fe, where during this time, 86 people came, and many of them died. We worked with them. Everybody that was on our staff said it was the most difficult and the most rewarding thing they had ever done. So basically, there was somebody in the next bedroom who was dying almost all of the time. It was a very intense way to live. And uh, one of my first meditation teachers, Trungpa Rinpoche, said that until one comes into, con into intimate contact with dying, that your spiritual practice will have the quality of being a dilettante. So a I dilettante was not, meaning? A dilettante meaning you're just doing spiritual practice in a kind of a superficial way. In a robotic way, in an automatic no, way. Not necessarily robotic, but not letting it really sink into the core of what your pain is, of who you are. So with the depth that it could be. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and in fact, in, in Buddhism, before we begin to practice, there are what are called the four mind-turning truths. And the first one is, you're going to die, but you don't know when. Now, what could be more obvious intellectually. Everybody knows that. But if we really knew that we were going to die and we didn't know when, that maybe you or I or somebody in the audience could die before the end of this interview being over, how would that change the way you and I were interacting? How immediate can we become? How alive can we become? How much passion and compassion and uh, loving kindness can we bring to being here if we really do get that we don't know when we're going to die. Well, Dale, let's stay with this point then. What, what is it to be living consciously, and what is it to be living and dying consciously? For those who don't know, and for those who are on automatic pilot and just working, and on the weekends doing the sports and relaxing, but they don't really want to think about these things. They don't really want to talk about it. Right. And if somebody is dying in the next room, they really don't want to acknowledge it either. And they certainly don't want to talk about it with their family or their friends. You walk into the house, oh, no, 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 don't bring that up. Don't talk about that. It's too painful. You know. So let's get into it. And what is, what, are, what is it like to be conscious with these <laughs> topics? <laughs> well, that's a very big question. And obviously, the different religions have different vocabularies and different ways of talking about that. Uh, in my experience, there is a joy that goes beyond happiness and sadness, wellness and illness, even living and dying. So as long as we are fixated on the content of our experience, one moment your mind is busy, the next moment your mind is calm, one moment there's a pain in your knee, the next moment your body feels good. As long as we're identified with these changing experiences, there won't be the stability in the heart and the mind to be conscious in a very ongoing kind of a way. Consciousness will be something that really just comes and goes very sporadically. Are you suggesting that's a place of witnessing? a place of resting, a place of inner peace that's watching everything, but, and it's not there to filter all the emotions. So it's, is so that are, possible? That's part of it. I, I would say there are really different levels of being conscious. So talking about being a witness, just paying attention, that's the beginning. If we can't really pay attention to what's going on in the moment, if we can't be with our own suffering, with our own happiness, with our own living, with with death as it appears around. If we can't be aware of that and be present without being buffeted by all the content, mm. then we can't be conscious. But there are, are deeper levels. So that after we're aware of something, can we meet it with an open heart? Can we bring compassion to bear on this world that has a lot of suf suffering in it? I mean, we look at, we're approaching right now at this point in January of 2016, presidential primaries. Uh, so people are talking about what should we do with 
immigration. What should we do with Syrian refugees? People are bombing each other. People are hating each other. All of this is going on. So suffering arises. There are three possibilities. One is pushing it away. I don't want to feel that. A year and a half ago, my brother died of pancreatic cancer. And he was informed that he was dying by his Kaiser oncologist in an after hours email. Instead of calling him up or inviting him into the office, my brother got an email at 7 p.m. saying, if you've got metastatic pancreatic cancer, there's nothing we can do right now. We're putting you on palliative care. And he frantically called me up and said, what does that mean? So that takes it to a whole different level. We've heard about people breaking up with lovers and saying, I don't want to be your lover anymore, but a doctor actually sending an email and saying you have pancreatic cancer and not doing it in person. And okay. not, that, that's, that's incredible. At the same time, it's easy to have compassion for my brother. What was that like for him? Can we have compassion for the doctor? Mm. He was not trained at all in working with suffering. He was trained in oncology. He's trained in chemotherapy and radiation and surgery. He's trained in uh, biomedicine. He's not trained in mm. human suffering. So he becomes a doctor because he wants to help people. He chooses to be an oncologist. And being an oncologist, a lot of your patients are going to die. So He's it begins and ends with just the physical there, and that's it, Well, of the uh, oncologist. In terms of their training, there's, that's 98% yes. of the training probably, yeah, the physical part of what it is going on and how can we help people not die. So getting back to your brother. Okay, so one possibility when suffering arises is to push it away. That's what the doctor was doing. By doing the after-hours email, he didn't necessarily then have to feel how this affected my brother. Another possibility, suffering arises. And we get caught in it. Oh my God, what a catastrophe. Maybe when I told you what happened to my brother, there was a moment of you saying, oh my God, poor Dale's brother. There is a third possibility, rather than pushing suffering away, rather than getting lost in it, can we have a compassionate response to suffering? So now we're taking being conscious one level deeper than just being aware. We're actually being compassionate. We're having an open heart meeting suffering. And one great saint said, the mind creates the abyss, the heart crosses it. So behind the solution to every problem and the level of duality here lurks another problem. It's an endless, it's an endless realm. And you were saying something in the beginning before about, as we were beginning, you were saying something about consciousness uh, being you didn't have to really think about things. Maybe you could, is that what you were saying? You didn't think or feel or I, I didn't quite understand. But what I'm saying here is that, that when you can really bring compassion to moment to moment experience, even when there's great suffering, even when your brother is dying or the doctor says, look, I've got really bad news for you, or when your child is unhappy, or you look around the world and you see What's going on in Europe right now, in Eastern Europe, it's, it's, it's tragic. The way, I mean, people are trying to find a life for their children, for themselves. Nations are really crumbling and becoming untenable in a certain way. So the next step is being aware of that suffering, not just pushing it away, not saying, oh my God, but being aware of it and then having compassion. And Rumi has this wonderful line, he says, grief is the garden of compassion. Well, what could that mean? A garden is a place where something beautiful or nutritious grows. So grief is the garden of compassion. Uh, grief is any emotion that arises in response to feeling separate. So if I feel separate from you right now, or if I feel separate from the audience, then I'm not connected. I'm, I'm feeling some sense of grief. We often think of grief simply as, I'm sad because somebody died, or I'm sad because a relationship ended. But think about the simple thing that happens. You're driving in traffic, somebody cuts you off, you get really angry. That's a grief reaction because you feel separate from that person. So grief is any emotion that arises in response to feeling separate. Compassion has the quality of being connected. So one way of looking at becoming more conscious is transmuting feelings of grief and separation 
to feelings of compassion and connection. Another quality of compassion is the quality of spaciousness, where there's not a, lot, not a lot of I caught up in my mind. So that I'm not thinking I'm feeling compassion for you, but there just is compassion. There's a spacious heart-mind that's meeting the situation. So we could imagine, even though we're in a television studio here with no windows, imagine that you were looking out through a window, and instead of a rainy day like it is today, there's actually a sunny day and you see blue sky. And what you're seeing is really what your mind sees. Your mind creates a window frame with how big you think you are. And into this chunk of sky comes a gray cloud. A cloud of anger, a cloud of grief, a cloud of happiness. It doesn't have to be a bad cloud. And if the window frame is small enough and the cloud is big enough, what do you see? You see gray. All you see is gray and you say, I'm angry, I'm happy, I'm grieving. One becomes identified with the content. But through awareness, through compassion, we begin to expand the window frame. Now the same size cloud can come and it's, you see it through the bigger window frame as having a blue border around it. Are you the sky or are you the cloud? And uh, in fact, we are the sky, everything else is the weather, if you will. I think Payment Children had that line. And uh, so not only is there a blue sky, but the cloud is moving. It's not staying. That this sadness or anger or fear, whatever it is, it's coming, but it's going to be gone. So what I'm suggesting here is there's a very different experience one can have between I am angry versus there's anger here right now. I am frightened versus there's anger, or there's that fear here right now. So that we don't really need to identify with each passing piece of content that is appearing to consciousness. So that one way of describing consciousness, uh, of being conscious is realizing that each moment, whether we're worried about the future or remembering the past or being afraid or being happy or being calm, is that each moment is Consciousness meeting experience. Consciousness doesn't change. Experience is changing all the time. And as long as we get fixated on what's changing, then we're kind of at the mercy of our environment. Which is talking about the story or talking about the emotions of it or the feelings or what other people are right. thinking as such. So if, as long as we just witness the story and watch it, and is there any difference between compassion and empathy or is it the same? You need to be empathetic to have compassion. But one can be empathetic and not feel compassion. I can feel empathy for you and say, well, I'm really feeling what you're feeling, but I'm not able to do anything about it. I, I want to get out of here. I feel how bad it is for you, but it's more than I can bear right now. I'm getting out of here. So compassion would be the verb, the action of Compassion is doing. a state of being that, that wishes for the alleviation of suffering which leads to compassionate action, which arises naturally because our nature is compassion. So compassion can really be spelled two ways. Mm. It can be spelled with a small C, it can be spelled with a capital C. A small C is I'm going to do compassion, I'm going to cultivate compassion, I'm going to be more compassionate. But we eventually realize that we are compassion. That is our nature. When we get our personality out of the way, the, the character structure out of the way, then what arises is compassion. Our real nature, our it's true nature. Our true nature, it's who we are. Okay. So there then is even a third level to being conscious. The first level is you're aware of what's going on, then you're compassionate in response to what's going on, and finally there is the path of wholeness or non-duality. There are wonderful teachers, Eckhart Tolle, Adyashanti, Ramana Maharshi, I'm sure you've heard of some of these people, who are really saying that we are consciousness. We're not the content of consciousness. We are that which does not change, pure awareness. So that, let's use another example. Uh, I've lost something and it's dark. So I pick up my flashlight and I'm looking around in the dark for my wallet, say. Okay, now usually we identify with, I'm the guy holding the flashlight. I'm Dale, I've got a flashlight in my hand. I'm a guy, I'm a certain age, I'm 
got certain characteristics. Sometimes we identify with what the light is shining on. Like if the light is shining on not a wallet, but it's shining on my anger, I say it's my anger, I'm angry. I identify with the anger. But what we're saying in this third level of consciousness, if you will, is that I'm the light of the flashlight. And that my light is the same as your light. It's not, in fact, it's identical. That there's one consciousness, there's one heart. There's is, is the anger still there, though, if you're The alive? anger is still there. It's not that we're becoming separated from our existence. In fact, by getting the obscurations out of the way, the fear of death out of the way, the fear of life out of the way, that we're more alive, we're more passionate, we're more in the flow of things. We feel our emotions. It's not that emotions go away. It's just that we're not lost in them. We're not busy getting caught in them or pushing away. So that one can feel, suppose somebody is grieving, and I work with people who are grieving, obviously. So one can push grief away and say, I don't want to feel that. I'm going to stay busy. I'm going to uh, get so busy in my job, or I'm going to drink a lot of wine every night and turn on the TV, because I, I don't want to really feel the feelings that are arising in me due to the fact that my beloved has died. On the other hand, one could get so caught up in the grief that you're not aware that you're really feeling it. You're lost in the grief itself, which leads to the third possibility, which is conscious grief work, being conscious of what does it feel like in your body to be grieving? What's going on in your mind when you're grieving? You're aware of it. You're feeling compassion for what's going on in you. So that really this notion of becoming conscious, is what we're saying is that we're becoming more alive, more awake, more joyful in what we're doing. This joy that transcends happiness and sadness. I would think that doing the later that you said of feeling it and allowing the emotions to come through you instead of pushing the emotions away would be much, much more, a lot of ease and flow would be there. I think the other pushing it away would cause a lot more pain and a lot more suffering and a lot more turmoil within oneself. I think fundamentally you're right, but if we look at it, there is such a strong momentum in each of us that when suffering arises, we want to get away from it. It's like wrestling in, in the thorn bushes. You're trying to get out of the thorn bushes and you're you're tossing and turning and you keep ripping yourself of the thorns exactly. instead of just being very gently trying to move yourself away from the thorns. So what I'm saying here is that if we try to get away from suffering, we're preventing our true compassionate nature from arising. So it's almost paradoxical that in order to heal suffering, we rest in it rather than trying to get away from it. But we've learned a lot of these patterns when we were very, very young when we were pre-verbal, when we were powerless, when the big people were, were uh, having all the power. So that now we're grown up, we're adults, but a lot of those energetic patterns are locked in our bodies and certain kinds of suffering arises and we immediately close down because we don't want to feel that. That happens again and again and again. So what I'm saying is really great and it's true and what you just suggested about the thorn bush is true. But it's easier said than done. It's, that's why they call it spiritual practice, where you have to practice being with our difficult emotions, right. as well as practicing being with our positive emotions without and, getting lost in them. And don't wait for the moment that you're dying to be prepared for it. Prepare many years ahead. Every moment is practice for dying. Yes. Not in some morbid kind of way. And I've got a confession to wake. Make. Yes, please. <laughs> Wait until maybe. Okay. <laughs> and my confession is that I'm not particularly interested in dying as a separate event, but only how dying leads to transformation of consciousness. Almost without exception, the most beautiful Americans I've ever met are people who are almost dead because they're willing to be themselves completely. They don't care about how they look that day or uh, how the warriors are doing or what the weather is like. It's, am I ever going to see you again? How much can I love you right now? How much can we be together here? And most people have a, a really busy life. There's a, there's a kind of a humorous saying in Tibetan Buddhism. When you're really young, you don't see the value of spiritual practice. When you're middle-aged, you're too busy to practice. And when you're old, it's too late. Okay. 
may be a bit overly pessimistic, but what I'm saying here is we need to practice being with whatever it is that's arising. And that's why people do things like meditate, where they cut out some of the grosser distractions. Like you shut your eyes, you get your body still, and you watch what's going on. You begin to uncover and become aware of some of these patterns. And then the next step is, can I have compassion for these patterns in myself, using meditation as a way of uncovering what is asking to be healed, what has been yearning for embrace for often many decades. Yes. Everything we're speaking about, I see it as a technology of mind. I don't see that you need to be really a Buddhist person to be able to bring this into one's life. You can be any religion, any belief, and this is common, practical, good sense to exactly. apply to one's life. Exactly. I'm really not a Buddhist, but yes. I've, I like to talk Buddhist because if I use the words God and love, I have no idea what you or anybody is hearing when I say those right. words because there's so much wounding often from early experiences with the church that you say the word God and people you know, have very different reactions to that. But Buddhism is a fresh language. At the same time, let's bring in the heart. Let's bring in the notion of the sacred. And uh, when we then get to this place of non-duality, we begin to not be so fixated on the content of experience, but really directly experiencing that there is a, uh, a sacred presence in each moment, in each experience. So that in the beginning of practice, we try to not be angry, we work with our fear, we work with our agitation. But at the end of practice, we see that uh, agitation is just as much God as calmness is God, that whiskey is just as much God as chamomile tea, that uh, anger is just as much God as kindness. And it's easy to take that kind of information and misuse it and say, well, I can go off and do whatever the heck I want to do, which is not really the message there, but beginning to appreciate the sacredness of everything. So what I'm hearing you say, that all of this can be your greatest teacher if you allow it to be, no matter what, if you're with the whiskey or if you're with the chamomile tea, yeah. it's your greatest teacher if you bring consciousness to it, if you bring the awareness and the tension to really what's going on with you and you're aware of your emotions, your yeah. feelings, and you're not getting lost in them. You're not letting them dictate totally how you are to feel. Yes. or what you're not feeling, or what you could feel. At the same time, for most people, most of the time, it's harder to be aware and present and conscious when you're drinking whiskey than when you're not drinking whiskey. It takes a very advanced practitioner, and I've been around some of them, <laughs> to not get lost in uh, the mind or the body state that, that alcohol might bring. I'm not, I'm not here to say alcohol is good or bad. I'm just saying that in the beginning of practice, it's very useful to try to uh, control your life in certain ways so that what you're saying, what you're putting in your mouth, what's coming out of your mouth, what you're doing with your body is leading to more wholesome activity. And then eventually we begin to see that this distinction between wholesome and unwholesome is really just making the mind more busy and that we can trust the heart to know without having to be categorizing things. Well, some of the dearest people that I have met have been given the life sentence of saying, no, you're going to be dying. You're uh -huh. going to be dying in the next year. You right. have six months to live. And these people are incredibly alive. They're just glowing, their eyes and their energy. And there's an urgency and there's a, there's a beauty of acceptance there. How and do you a, think they? How and there's a think? vulnerability, very vulnerable there. Uh huh. Yes. How do you think they got to that place of being so open? Well, they knew that they couldn't be distracted anymore. Right. They knew they had to go very deep, and they had to say, "Well, what is real to me now? What, what?" And as you mentioned about love, who do I love, and who loves me, and what's it all about? And in answering that, what's it all about? They surrendered to all of it. Right. Where before. 
for decades, they did not want to think about it. They were just coasting along, and it's what we mostly all do. And I'm in the grocery stores or in stores, and there's long lineups, and I could feel all of this impatience about everybody behind me. You know, and they're like looking at their watch, and they're, you know, they, could, could she hurry up? Can the cashier hurry up? And I'm just there. I, I turn around to them and I smile, and I, sometimes I say, well, I think it's a great time to cultivate patience right now. <laughs> what would that like be like? How, what would that be like? How do they respond to that? Well, you? the man a week ago, an elderly, very distinguished man, said, to, and he got more angry as I said that to I'll him. I bet he did. He got really, and then, and then, and then he said, at one point he said, "Listen, you just be there. I'm here, and don't look at me." Right. And that's it. Like I was bringing up something that I wasn't criticizing him, I wasn't judging him. But he felt judged. He felt judged. I was just <laughs> offering him a gift of, let's just breathe into that. The cashier is going as fast as she can. She can't go any faster. And let's have a beautiful moment here. But he, didn't, the, he didn't want any part of that. One of the things okay? I really <laughs> learned in being around dying people, and maybe one of the hardest lessons, is to allow people to have their suffering. Hmm. And what does that mean? Have to, have to well, suffer. what it means is that sometimes people aren't ready to let go of it. And if I try to prematurely pull somebody out of the place they are, it might actually make it even harder for them. Maybe somebody needs to go to the bottom before they can start coming up again. Okay. So it really is almost asking myself, what is the contract? What's the contract now between you and me? We're sitting here, you're the interviewer, I'm the interviewee. And we could be talking about something else, but why don't we talk about here we are, here's the two of us. How honest can I be with you? How honest can you be with me? I mean, how much can I, am I just supposed to be telling interesting things to the camera so we make this great video? So there is some kind of implied contract. There's a role here that we're both part of. And when we're in a, a grocery line, there's a different role. And the guy in the, in the grocery line is saying, I'm not in any relationship with you. I don't really, I'm not interested in waking up right now. I'm, I'm in my emotional thing and it's none of your business, which is his complete right. And if somebody's dying and they want to push help away, that's their complete right. If somebody wants to die unconsciously or, or if somebody uh, is unable to open up, then Am, am I to judge them? Am I to say they should be doing it differently? No. So let's segue into what it is to be conscious then for those who have a curiosity to it, an idea that something could be different. What it would be like to be dying consciously? Well, dying consciously, uh, we can make a big shortcut here because it's really exactly like living consciously, which is what we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes or mm -hmm. so. And the good news is that we don't need any special talents or abilities or information to die consciously. Then we have already learned to live consciously, being aware, being compassionate, feeling our sense of empowerment, the sacred arising within us moment to moment. Uh, whether we're doing it now when we don't know if we're dying or when we're going to die, is what we need to do in, in our deathbed. The uh, film critic Roger Ebert, who you may know had that rather difficult cancer of his face and his neck, I believe, was interviewed about uh, his relationship with his cancer. And he was typing his interview out and he said, as I'm typing the sentence, I don't know if I'm going to be alive when I type the period at the end of the sentence. So when there's this idea you're going to die but you don't know when, we're assuming that, well, I don't know, but it's not going to be now. It's not going to be the next half hour. It's not going to be today. But we don't really know that. So that it's very difficult to start these practices of waking up and becoming more compassionate, more uh, aware, uh, more resting in sacred presence after you start getting sick because after you get sick there's often drugs in your body you're running around to doctors you're feeling weak there's there's all kinds of things going on that often make it difficult to practice that so it'd be a good idea to use your conscious living and then be able to segue into your conscious dying moment to moment moment to moment yeah
And if you haven't been living consciously and you've been keeping life away from you all of these decades, then there's a correlation between that that you're not going to be able to live a conscious death. Well, there is a big advantage when you die. And the big advantage is the following, that right now what makes it so difficult for us to really get on a fundamental level that we are enlightened already, that we are whole, is that we're so identified with the place we're separate. I've got this body, you've got that body, I'm a man, you're a woman, I'm over here, you're over there. All the world's religions at their deepest inner level say that we are whole right now. There's nothing to get. We've got it already. And the mistake is thinking that we don't, that we aren't, okay? So the first thing that happens when you die is you don't have a body in a, you don't have a body anymore. You're, you're, uh, one of my teachers said that what reincarnates is your bad habits. But anyway, uh, it's a long discussion. I, well, let's speak about that. You've been around a number of people that have been passing, so you have a good idea, an educated guess. So you've been witnessing people dying. What do you think happens to us after we die? Well, it isn't so much being around people, but being around some very, I've, I've had the blessing to be around some of the greatest saints of the late 20th century who said all these things about living and they said things about death and dying. And what everything they said about living seems to have borne out to be true. So I'm assuming that what they said about dying is also probably pretty much also true. And I, how much time do we have here? I mean, it's really a whole talk about what happens after you die. I don't know how much I can summarize it. We are good. Okay. Well. The near-death experience is the first part of the dying process, and people leave their body, they're on an operating table, they've been in an accident, something happens, and they experience a great, a, a, a really profound sense of wholeness, integrity, safety. If you have a near-death experience and you've been blind all of your life, you, you can see what color uh, tie the doctor has on. Uh, if you have a lot of morphine in your bloodstream, it's not affecting your consciousness. If you've been in a traumatic accident, as consciousness leaves the body, it doesn't feel or is affected by the trauma that just happened. And if to the you're body. in dire pain, right, as you're leaving, the pain is not there. stays and is not there. Okay. So in the near-death experience, sometimes there's a tunnel, sometimes there's guides, sometimes there's not, but very consistently, somebody is attracted toward this beautiful light. Because it's only a near-death experience, they don't fully merge into the light. They come back into their body and say, look, I've had this remarkable experience. I'm no longer afraid of dying the same way I used to be, and you don't need to be either. Dying is safe. Uh, there could be a slight confusion here because the consciousness that experienced the wholeness, the, the safety of the dying process is a consciousness that's not identified with the body and personality. Then you come back into the body and personality and say, hey, it's safe. Nothing is less safe to your body and personality than death. Okay. So but for those the, who are leaving their body, this body, right. what happens? Could you say that again? I'm sorry. For those who are actually dying okay. and they die okay. and they have left their body, what happens? Okay. So the first part of the process is the same. Uh, you leave your body. Uh, you feel the wholeness, integrity, safety, but now you merge into the light. You become the light. Why is this light so attractive? Rhetorical question. This light is so attractive because it is home. It is our true nature. It is who we are right now. In the Bible, Christ says the kingdom of heaven is within you. What is that kingdom of heaven? It is Christ consciousness. It is Buddha nature. It is who we are. And the, one of the first things that happens after we die is we become enlightened. We merge into that light. Now... But how about the people that are terrible, evil, murderer people? Are they taking that with them, that same that is the evil, true nature, that same that angry? That is the true nature of everybody, no matter how bad they are, no matter how many bad things they have done or how, how saintly they are they still have Buddha nature. They still have Christ consciousness. That is who they are. 
So that's all erased and forgotten, whatever they were doing? I didn't doing. say it was erased. That's, okay. that's a little further down okay. the, the, the road here. So that if in your life you were able to rest in that light, then dying is just another dying into the light, and you're done. There you are. But the Tibetans say this light is as bright as a thousand suns. That's pretty darn bright. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that for most of us, that's going to be too bright. So that, have you had the experience, I certainly have, and I think pretty much everybody has, that you've had a moment of great love. You see your child born, or you're, at the, you're out in nature at a, a perfect day, or you're hearing your favorite piece of music, or you're with your beloved partner. Something is going, you've, you had this great spiritual experience, your heart is like wide right. open. You feel the expansiveness of who you are. Right. There's a lot of love welling up within you. And then 15 seconds later, you're thinking, what's for lunch? Mm -hmm. That in, Why don't we stay in that, that wide open space? Why don't we stay in the spaciousness of love that we experience again and again and again? And the reason we don't is because the ego structure gets scared. The ego structure doesn't like that spaciousness. The ego structure wants to be reified and say, I am. Even if it's problematic, even if it's those clouds in the sky, the ego structure would rather be frightened or angry than not exist. So that this quality of being completely open is really a surrender into not knowing, into just being. And being means letting go of this, all this ego-centric identification. So that's why it's a process. That's why people go into psychotherapy and body work and meditation retreats and things like that. Because it isn't as easy as just doing that. There's all this momentum behind wanting to be somebody. So that you've died and all of a sudden you're in that light. Can you rest in the light? If you can't, if the light's too bright, then the stuff that makes it too bright for you, all the identifications, the hopes and fears and desires, all the stuff that made you be evil. Or the torment that you were living. All that stuff is going to be there. It'll come. It'll come. And you have a chance of just letting go of that, or you have a chance of just uh, getting stuck in it. So you have a great opportunity at that moment if you could recognize exactly. this light and be familiar with that light, because before you died, you were recognizing it as you were living. And if you're recognizing it as you were living, that purity, that light within you, you'll certainly recognize it upon your death. So what we're saying here is that the, the dying experience is the, the best opportunity in, ex, in an extended lifetime to really surrender into who you truly are. So what I would like to do now, uh, my dear friend Stephen Levine died five days ago. Yes. He was my mentor. He was my brother. Uh, and he, he said to me, he said, I haven't said this to anybody else, but I promise you that if you want me to be with you when you're dying, I will come and, and guide you as you're dying. So now that he's dead, I think he'll even have a better chance to guide me than as if he were in, Santa, if he were in New Mexico and I'm here. He said this to you? Yeah. But the reason I'm bringing him up is I'd like to tell a story about somebody dying that involves me and Stephen and a, and a, and a, a patient that yes, we had. Yes, please. So... Many years ago, he and I were living separately in Santa Cruz back in the late 1970s, right before we all moved to Santa Fe, as I mentioned earlier in the show. And a young man moved from Toronto, Canada to Santa Cruz. He was dying of non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma. Uh, he didn't know why he moved to Santa Cruz, but he just felt called to move to Santa Cruz. Stephen and I were teaching a Tuesday night meditation group every week, and this young man named Chris started coming to the group. He got sicker and sicker. He couldn't keep coming to the group. And the meditation group became his support, taking care of him as he was dying. Because he was a young man, late 20s, one of the things that was going on for him was that he was feeling sexually frustrated because he didn't have enough energy to be a sexual being. He couldn't even get out of bed. And it really bothered him that he was going to die without having more sexual experience. So it just turned out, as chance would have it, that the night before he died, I 
through the graveyard shift, no pun intended. So I was at his bedside from midnight to 6 a.m. He had been in a light comatose state for a day or two, hadn't spoken, had moved just a little bit. And I'm sitting there meditating in the wee hours of the night, three, four o'clock or something. And all of a sudden I hear Chris rustling about and I look at him and he's looking at the ceiling with a look of intense rapture, like the heavenly host has just come to greet him or something. I said, Chris, Chris, what do you see? And he said, beautiful women wherever I look. And those were the last words that man ever spoke. So that when he was actually dying the next morning and Stephen was there and some of the people from the group were there, Stephen said to him, Chris, if you happen to see beautiful women as you're dying, realize it's only a projection of your desire system. You don't have to buy into it. You don't have to follow those desires. You can trust the wisdom and the love that you have cultivated in a lifetime. Don't get caught in the desires. Don't get caught in hopes, fears, and desires. Those things we push away and those things we get caught in. And it felt like those words went really deeply into Chris and that he really opened up and had a very beautiful dying. All fear is fear of death, and fear of death is equal to lack of enlightenment. Because fear of death is the place where we're separate, where I'm separate from you. And as long as I'm separate, that's where I'm going to be afraid to die. The New York Times had a survey. What are you most afraid of? Number one, speaking in public. Number three, dying. Okay, so it's kind of funny, but the place in me that would be afraid about speaking in public is exactly the same place that's going to be afraid when I think I might die soon. So at one's death, one would want to be in a good place of happiness and surrender and not anger and holding on at that moment. That would be beneficial. That would be beneficial. So at this moment, it's about totally letting go and, and with a curiosity, perhaps. Yeah. What else would you add to that? Ah. Uh, you were at somebody's bedside and they were just going in the next hour. How? And they were lucid. They were not drugged up on morphine and as such. Well, the... Their breath well, was getting more shallow and they were... At that point, it isn't really necessarily clear to me how much saying something wonderful or positive is useful. I think that the way somebody lives is going to affect the way they die, and the way they die is going to affect what happens next. But the quality of being that I bring to that bedside, am I there wide open, trusting my heart, trusting my willingness to surrender into consciousness? being a living invitation for that person to do the same thing. There are practices that uh, I teach people. The Living Dying Project, which we really haven't talked about much, is an organization here in Marin where I, I train people to guide the dying, to offer spiritual and emotional support. And uh, we have workshops to train people to do that. And then people in the community who want that support uh, free of charge, one-to-one -one support, get in touch with us. They go to livingdying.org and we can match volunteers up with people who are dying. So that there are techniques. There's the ah breath, there's something called the POA practice. These things are talked about on our website. It's a very uh, extensive website with practices and notions and attitudes to bring to conscious dying. Did you mention that it was all on a volunteer basis? Yeah. Okay. So people can come to the bed of a, a dying person and they don't have to pay for it and it's uh, or they could or as such. Yeah. Or is there a charge? There's no charge. Oh. So this is all about service. Yes. And you've trained all these people and uh, over a period of time to be able to be familiar with able to be a, a volunteer. And in fact I'm doing a training in San Anselmo and one in Santa Rosa soon. So the, the, these trains are ongoing. How long is the training? It's, it's just a weekend. Uh, the big dirty secret here is that I can't train somebody to be great at 
uh, uh, being a guide for conscious dying is how much have you processed your own fear of death up to this point in your life? I can, I can teach you some practices. We can talk about this. I can give you some confidence. But there's ongoing support after somebody takes the training. I would think if you take the training, that would help you in just as, a, as one dying. You'd want to know those things. It would do that too. Yeah. But getting back to this point where I'm not quite completing is that there's two levels of practice. One is there are things you can do. There are things you can say for sure. There's the ah breath. There's poa practice. There's helping people feel confident and happy and connected. Well, let's talk about the ah breath. What, what is that? But l let me just complete. And the second thing is just the quality of being. It's not what you're saying. It's not what you're saying. It's who you are. Mm -hmm. And until I am a fully realized being, there is going to be some fear of death in me. I might not be afraid of the idea of death. I might not be intellectually afraid of dying. But the body wants to keep breathing. The body is holding on to life. So what I'm saying here is that as I'm with somebody who's dying, can I be doing my work? Can I be aware of any place where I pull back, where my fear of death gets resonated? Can I have compassion for that place in myself, that place in the other person? Can I keep opening to that? Can I keep going into this non-dual place beyond concept, if you will? To the extent I'm doing that, that's this living invitation. So that the ah breath is a very simple practice. Uh, I, I'm kind of reluctant to try to teach it in three minutes here. Oh, no, don't teach it, because we just have a few moments left, actually. Okay. If you just give me a, a very brief overview of what the breath is. Is it more of a conscious belly breathing, of, of, of no, you're, cathartic you're, breathing? It's, it's a practice where you and a client are together, and as the client or the patient breathes out, you make the sound ah. Mm. Now, the sound ah is the, the seed syllable of the open heart. So that each time the person is breathing out, you are encouraging them to let go into the heart. And the nature of the heart is boundless spaciousness. Uh, whether we realize that or not, the heart is big enough to include all the suffering in the universe. So that as somebody is approaching death in the weeks before and right up to the moment of death, guiding somebody in the ah breath, when they're breathing out, you're making this encouraging sound to just expand into infinite spaciousness, which is love, which is sacredness. Each breath, ah, 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 so that you're meditating on your patient's breath and you're making this sound as they breathe out. Mm. There's a beautiful exchange going on there. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'd like to thank you very, very much, Dale. And it's been a very, very beautiful conversation, and a conversation is very, very necessary. My pleasure. And uh, for those who want to know more about Dale's work from the Art of Conscious Living, please contact livingdying.org. And do take care of yourselves and take care of others. Thank you.